President of the UN General Assembly, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Ambassadors, Mayor of Stockholm, Stockholm Water Prize laureates and award winners, distinguished guests and friends, welcome to the 2017 World Water Week. My name is Therese Schermande Magnusson. I'm the Director of Transboundary Water Management at Siwi. It is really a great pleasure for me to welcome you here to Stockholm and welcome also to those of you who are following us live. You help us make this truly a global conference. We have traveled from all corners of the world, nearly 130 countries, to discuss the opportunities and challenges presented by this year's theme, Water and Waste, Reduce and Reuse. We believe it is important to take a holistic view of waste, both in our actions and our values, how we think about waste, how much we waste, and more importantly, the opportunity we have to change the systems and psychology around waste and water. During the week, we will learn about successes and challenges from across the world, from a wide range of water-dependent sectors, such as food, sanitation, energy, agriculture, and production. We will travel from source to sea, from rural to urban. Sticky. Each year, as we prepare for the World Water Week, we ask ourselves, how can we improve collaboration? How can we reach beyond the walls of the week? Better engage decision makers at the highest level and the decision makers of tomorrow. But also, of course, those putting ideas into actions on the ground today. As part of our effort of the World Water Week, uh, making it more inclusive and innovative, we have introduced the gold standard, a certification for events that have benchmarks regarding gender and youth representation and encourage audience particip participation and engagement. Look out for the gold star in the program, because it is our hope that in the coming years, all events will demonstrate this gold standard. Also this year, we have launched a new session series called The Showcase. Woven throughout the events, seminars and sofas, the showcases are an opportunity for conveners to tell their water stories and share their perspectives, initiatives, tools and projects. Interest has surpassed all of our expectations with some 59 showcases featured in this year's program, including Seaweed's showcase of some of our favorite projects this afternoon. Now to something very dear to me. During the summer, Seaweed ran a campaign and photo competition called the Water Women. Women play critical roles in all aspects of water governance. But unfortunately, it can be difficult to find images of women in their diverse and important roles. We sought to change that. We wanted to show the true face of women in water. As decision makers, water managers, academics and effective water users to illustrate these important roles and to tell the stories of water women. The response has been truly amazing and you can also see the winners of the photo competition at the Seaway booth and view a wider selection of entries online or in the gallery at Norda Latin. Last but not least, you have undoubtedly heard that we have taken another 
rather large step towards going paperless. By not printing the full program, we have saved over half a million of sheets of paper. Isn't that great? <laughs> yes. And now, to a speaker that I have been really looking forward to, the only Swede to ever go out into space, someone who can bring a whole new meaning to the term global perspective, Professor Christer Fuglesang, astronaut and member of the Royal Academy of Science in Sweden. I look forward to hearing how your perceptions of Earth has changed, and especially, of course, its water bodies, uh, since you saw it from space. Professor Christer Fuglesam, welcome. Tether to the Ford UIA D ring. And I can confirm my voice to their Ford UIA D ring, they'll close better luck. Great, Danny, I see the airlock thermal cover is open. You can egress the airlock. Remember to avoid that MMOD strike. Roger that. On this very day, the 28th of August, eight years ago, I commenced my second and last uh, space mission. The launch of the, of the Space Shuttle Discovery towards the International Space Station, which you just watched there. I was happy, I, I was lucky, I was going to perform my fourth and fifth spacewalk. Spacewalks are really the ultimate space experience. It's just you and your spacesuit, designed to keep a human being alive for up to eight hours in the harsh and grim space environment. Actually, this spacesuit is rather more of a one-person space vehicle than something you dress up in. But in this vehicle, the only consumables you have are oxygen and water, the two most vital ingredients for us to live. Although, to some extent, you don't want the exciting and wonderful, but also sometimes hard spacewalk to end. You are grateful to your crewmates when they get you to help inside when you come back. I've been given the privilege to view our atmosphere, our extraordinary beautiful planet from far above, about 400 kilometers out into space. And views are spectacular in particular during the spacewalks. Most of what you see is blue and white. Blue from the oceans, from the lakes, and also the white clouds are in water. This photo was actually taken during my very first spacewalk, during the mission in 2006. And we are over New Zealand, and up to the right you see North Island, and to the now left is the South Island. And this uh, picture became later known as the travel picture of the year 2006. For millennia, humans took our world, our environment, and the water here just for granted. But perhaps this picture, taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts during the Christmas time of 1968, of the Earth rising above the moon horizon, Perhaps this picture has done the most to profoundly change that perception. That planet is our, the whole university's, small and fragile spaceship in the immense universe. And we better take care of it. When orbiting the Earth, occasionally one notices uh, human constructions. Although this might look as a piece of art, it's actually an artificial lake, a water reservoir in Cameroon, Africa, near the Mbam River. Our civilization started 
with water managing, how we manage to control and uh, regulate the flow of water, and this civilization which eventually has taken us all the way out into space. However, sometimes this water management has also led to disastrous consequences. These photos are from space over the Aral Sea, once the fourth largest lake on Earth. But due to excessive irrigation, using the water from the two rivers feeding the Aral Sea, it eventually almost completely evaporated. I really hope that we can learn from catastrophic mistakes like this one and be smarter and more careful in the future how we use the precious resource of fresh water. It only takes 80 minutes to orbit the Earth. And once you've done an orbit, the Earth has turned itself about 23 degrees. So you always see new views. You see the oceans, the islands, the deserts, the mountains, the forests, but you never see borders between countries. Coming over conflict zones, areas, it is then natural to reflect over why do we fight over these imaginary lines? On the space station, we were 13 astronauts from five different countries with various backgrounds, and we had problems, but we never fought. We helped each other to solve them. And we must do the same also on this huge spaceship, the Earth. What you see, by the way, here is the Red Sea. To the left, you have the Nile. And up above there uh, is Gaza, one of many conflict zones on Earth today. That we do have problems which we have to solve together, I think this photo illustrates nicely. Up in the top, you have the dark Earth. Down there, the darkness of space. You can see the tail of the shuttle. And that very thin color line, band, that is all our atmosphere, roughly 100 kilometers thick. But it's only the 5% closest to Earth where we have enough oxygen such that we can live. Basically, all life we, life we know about can live without an artificial spaceship or spacesuit. And we better take care of that. We are messing up that atmosphere today. We must take care of our planet, our home here in the universe. And to see your home is always special. And a few times I can see my hometown, Stockholm. It definitely always felt very special. And by the way, I, I hope you will enjoy this week here in uh, my hometown, which in my eyes, of course, biased, but nevertheless, are beautifully located on the waters between Melar and and uh, the Baltic. And I'll take the opportunity to uh, also tell a, a good story about water management. When I was a kid, growing up only 50 meters from the shore of Melaren, it was prohibited to swim in the lake. The water was considered much too polluted. Not that we kids cared too much, of course, but still. But decisions were made and measures taken, and today, since several decades, it's fine to swim anywhere in the Mjellaren. And it's in anywhere around the waters of Stockholm, and you may have seen it uh, the, this weekend with a triathlon going on, a lot of people swimming there. So we can do the right things if we take the right the decisions. In space, the space station, ISS, is the home for many astronauts. Many of them living there for as much as six months. My two space trips only lasted two weeks each, actually, much too short. But it's expensive and complicated to send anything to space. So it's important to conserve the resources and reuse as much as possible up there. But I like that point out that at least the electricity, the electrical power, is for, for free and 100% green. It all comes from the huge solar arrays, which look like big winds or perhaps some sails. 
I'll say more about the life support system on board in a moment. But first, I want to mention that also methods for growing food in space is being developed. What you see there is the first crop of red lettuce on ISS three years ago. And growing food supplements and to minimize the food which has to be carried to space will be increasingly important in the future when we go further and further in space, eventually to Mars. It also has psychological benefits, something will also important when you leave the Earth and you cannot even see it in the, in the end as just a little dot. Now, one important research goal is to optimize uh, the production compared to the resources required to grow, grow it. And uh, for example, minimizing the use of water. And the data from these experiments, development will of course also be beneficial on Earth to help uh, farmers here to produce better crops at small areas with an optimum amount of water and nutrition. It's a challenge to keep people alive in a closed environment for long times. And the weightlessness in space doesn't make it easier. And by, by the way, uh, about water, you cannot even get a shower on the space station. Not so much because we want to uh, use as little water as possible, but it's very difficult to make a shower when the water doesn't fall down. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, the life support system on the ISS is very complicated with several loops in order to recycle as much as possible. Or perhaps one, one could say that rather to re reuse as much as, as is practical possible given the energy available. I mean, basically, if you just have enough cheap and usable energy, well, then we could do uh, anything. Well, anyhow, if you look at the water loop here, which is the part in the, in, the, in the blue there, so from the crew in the center, the water leaves by sweat, by breathing air, by urine. The water which goes out in the atmosphere is collected by condensation and cleaned. Also, the urine is processed and cleaned. And it can be drunk again, and it's drunk again. <laughs> we had a farewell toast from that uh, mission, which, which actually was in recycled urine. <laughs> Tasted fine, and it's a more <laughs> psychological thing which we need to learn. <laughs> so, um, uh, also, uh, but this life support system is pretty demanding, and, and it also requires quite a a lot of attention and work by the crew, something we're very happy to do. Now, these technologies which are being developed for space travel, and the goal eventually is to make them completely closed, uh, such that we use less and less consumables, which bring, has to be brought to space. Those technologies are, of course, also of great interest for water management and reuse on Earth. So we can learn from it, from that. Now, finally, Let's take a look how water behaves in weightlessness, how we may deal with water in space. Normally, when we want to drink water, we fill up a bag with water, and then we drink out of that straw. But in weightlessness, you can do other things. And if you want to give it some taste to your water, or you can put some candies, which you may have brought with you, in the shape of Space shuttles here, well, one shuttle became a submarine, but uh, the others now are orbiting this global plan water planet. Now comes the challenge. Can we drink it? Yes. That's what you can do with water in space. Well, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and for attending the World Water Week of 2017. Thank you for helping life on spaceship Earth to survive through your crucial work on water and waste and reduced and reuse. Let's all take care of the Earth. Thank you very much.
Thank, Thank you. you. Timing now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Fuglesang, for sharing uh, these experiences, very relevant to this year's theme. And I better understand why my son wants to be, or wanted to be, he's 18 now, but uh, an astronaut. Thank you so much. Uh, I now have the great pleasure to welcome Seawee's Executive Director, Torgny Holmgren, to tell us more about what to expect of this week. First, a big thanks to our astronaut and Professor Christy Fuglesang to providing us a truly different and beautiful perspective in preparing this World Water Week, I thought, where on earth are you really used to saving water? And the answer was quite obvious, in outer space, of course. Well, President of the United Nations General Assembly, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Ambassadors, Mayor of Stockholm, Stockholm White Prize Laureates, Award winners, distinguished guests, dear friends. Welcome to World Water Week and welcome to Stockholm. Maybe you've had some time to stroll around in Stockholm. Then you may understand why Stockholm is called the beauty of water. But it has not always been so. When I walk the streets and case of Stockholm, I reflect on the water journey that Stockholm has made from having the dirtiest water in, in Europe at uh, 100 years ago to be one of the cleanest today. Of course, it's the result of hard work and focused work. It is a journey that I hope many more cities and countries around the globe will be able to make. Indeed, I think this is what all of us in the water community work for every day. We all share the belief that access to clean, fresh water is an absolute requirement to achieve sustainable development. My colleagues at CV invest a lot of work to build this week, and we have great help in this effort. I would like the opportunity to particularly thank the Swedish government and SIDA, the Swedish International Development Corporation, and the city of Stockholm for their ongoing to support us, and the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development for its strategic support of this week. I also would like to take, uh, uh, to recognize uh, our key collaborating partners for this week. This year's event is CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, the International Water Association, and the International Water Management Institute, as well as our different partners and sponsors for helping us making this week a success. Dear friends, we know that water is a local resource. We see proof of that every day, of the devastating effect that too little, too much, or too dirty water has on people and on societies. The effects of droughts are, for instance, felt in by farmers in Portugal and Spain, by families in Cape Town who have suffered the worst drought in a century, and perhaps worst in Somalia, where people perish every day. Even in Sweden, we are facing water scarcity. In some parts of the country, this summer has ground level, groundwater levels been the lowest ever recorded. Thereby, we are now sharing a reality with countless countries around the world. But all these many local crises are building up to one looming global crisis, and we are in this together. We gather here today, or following the week online, we have the knowledge, and we can be the voice to be the agents of change ourselves, and we also have the power to influence decision makers globally and locally. By using our expertise, our experience, and our cloud, we can make sure that water is recognized as most critical to achieve the sustainable development goals and also the Paris Agreement on climate change. This links also to something I believe we should discuss more in depth, the value of water. With increasing scarcity, we must recognize that many values attached to water, be they economic, social, environmental, cultural, or religious. I believe that by revaluing water, we will develop a deeper understanding and respect for this precious resource, and thus be better prepared to more careful make use of it. To advance our knowledge, 
and learn more about managing, managing scarce water resources, we choose water and waste, reduce and reuse as the theme of this World Water Week. The theme, I believe, touches the very core of our daily lives. To reduce, some drastic changes will be needed, especially by the main water users, be they in the industry sector, energy production, and in the agriculture sector. But also as regards better reuse, we do have quite a bit of knowledge, but there is much still need to be learned. During this week, I hope to hear about plenty of innovative methods and new ideas, and maybe what we heard from Professor Fogus and we gave us some ideas about this water bubble, especially. Now, uh, we do have some prominent guests here this week. Among them are the President of the United Nations General Assembly, His Excellency Peter Thompson, the President of Hungary, uh, Janos Adler, and the Swedish Deputy Prime Minister, Isabella Levine. I would also like to recognize the former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, Honorable Kevin Rudd, and the former Prime Minister of Jordan, uh, Mr. Kasavine. And of course, most importantly, we have our Stockholm Water Prize laureate this year, Professor Stephen McCaffrey, a genuine water champion and one of the architects of the International Water Law Framework and you are with us this morning, and we are eager to learn from you rich experience in water cooperation in just a short while. Uh, this annual week in Stockholm is uh, nestled in between the UN high-level political forum taking place in July and the upcoming climate conference annually, November, December, this year, November in Bonn, or COPS if you like. It makes Stockholm an ideal opportunity for us to meet and form a common pathway to implement the global agreements reached in 2015. And we are pleased, as over the last few years, to have senior representatives of not only the previous, current, but also the incoming presidents of the climate change conferences with us this week. Furthermore, we welcome not only water ministers, but also ministers in the fields of environment, energy, agriculture, infrastructure, technology, and finance this week. This is truly a sign that water is not a sector, it's a connector. And once more, the high-level panel on water has chosen this week as a key movement to meet, hold consultations, and report on progress and finalize reports. Our aim of the week is also to bridge generations and to bring in the future, the youth. I would, for instance, encourage everyone on YouTube to walk over to the next building and look at the posters produced by the finalists of this year's Stockholm Junior Water Prize competition. I'm sure that you all will be amazed and inspired by their terrific work. The youth will also play an important role in reporting the outcomes of the week. You will meet them when they present their conclusions upcoming Friday in the concluding session. But before that, we have a lot to do events to attend, debates to be held, and networking to be done. Once again, welcome and thank you to join us this week. Together, we are charting the path for how water will be managed in the next decade and in the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Torgny Holmgren. Stockholm is also my hometown, and I'm very proud to be able to welcome so many distinguished guests and international guests to my city, our city. The city of Stockholm is an important and long-standing contributor to the week and to the prices. And what an inspiring environment to work in during the World Water Week. I would now like to welcome uh, the, and invite the mayor of Stockholm to the stage. Ms. Karin Van Gård. Your Excellencies, Stockholm Water Prize laureates, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you all to Stockholm, my hometown. Stockholm is, as you all all aware of a city on water. The city is located on several islands between the Lake Mälaren and the Baltic Sea. A third 
of the city has green areas and another third is fresh water. We live with and on water. And water issues is in our very heart. Therefore, I am very proud that we host World Water Week. And I'm thankful for your attendance at this week where we have an opportunity to develop water management policies for the future. In an age of a globalization, we are constantly reminded that water is a resource we all depend on. It is the very fundament of life to secure everyone's access to clean water should be the first issue that the world unites on. But it still isn't. The theme of this year's World Water Week, Water and Waste, Reduce and Reuse, is an important reminder to all of us. Good water governance is a precondition for health, prosperity and welfare. Water is a circular resource. The water we drink today has been used by millions before us. Bad decisions for our water today will reflect on coming generations. We cannot just repeal and replace decisions that's made the desert grow. The water levels rise and our water toxic. We need to learn how to reduce harm and reuse the resources we claim from the earth. Access to clean water is one of the most important international issues when it comes to ensuring sustainable development, peace and security. Clean water is fundamental from a health perspective and securing access it to all people and a growing population is one of the greatest challenges for the international community. The cities of the world are growing, which is pleasing and at the same time challenging. As cities grow, so do our responsibilities. What we do, the policies we choose, are becoming even more important. Cities represent a large part of our populations and certainly a large portion of future growth. We have the job growth, the universities, the creative ideas. We also face the biggest emissions, the social problems, housing shortage. We have the biggest challenges but also the greatest possibilities. Our joint participation in the struggle for sustainable solutions is key for global success. And that means a growing responsibility, a moral responsibility towards future generations and their ability to live in cities where it's possible to work live in security, and drink the water. As for Stockholm, water has for a long time been one of the key factors in our city's policy making. The waterways had been our connection to the outside world. It's been the basis for our industrialization and growth. And today, the beauty of being a city on water is what attracts many thousands of visitors to our town. We are fortunate in our close relation to water. In Sweden and in Stockholm, we have an abundant supply of fresh water. And we do enjoy the result of forward-thinking decision makers in the past who led our town towards sustainable water management. Investments in waste, 
water infrastructure and environmental protection have improved the water and quality of life of our inhabitants. And at the time when the city is growing fast, we need to go on safeguarding the water supply. Therefore, we will continue to invest in resilient water solutions. In fact, two of the biggest infrastructure projects in the city right now are about resilient water solutions. Slussen, which means the lock, is an area of central Stockholm connecting Lake Mälaren and the Baltic Sea. Buses, the underground, cars, boats, cyclists and pedestrians all converge at Slussen. But it is old and need to be modernized. Rebuilding Slussen is not only a city development project. Slussen is a vital issue for the entire region. At New Slussen, it will be possible to release double the amount of water from Lake Mälaren. This will dramatically reduce the current high risk of flooding and protect key infrastructure and drinking water for two million people. The other project, Stockholm's Future Waste, Wastewater Treatment, is about a major expansion of the Henrik Stahl's water, wastewater treatment plan. The project is necessary to cope with the growing population in Stockholm, but the initiative will also result in a cleaner water and reduce the dis discharge into the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is threatened by extensive over-fertilization. As always, with water resources, the solutions to this and the only possible way to save the Baltic Sea is extensive national and international cooperation. The city of Stockholm has taken an active role in the struggle for a sustainable environment for many decades now. Stockholm is a good example of consensus-based policy making. A sustainable environment has been one of the city's top priority for the last 20 years. And we to continue to have ambitious goals for the city of Stockholm on the area of environmental concern. Adaptation to climate change is a major focus for Stockholm. Stockholm aims to be fossil fuel free 2040. This has to be reflected in the decisions we make every day. One example of that is that Stockholm fuels its public transportation with biogas. An excellent example of how waste and waste water can be harnessed for resources. I hope that this week will help the global community to get closer to the goal of a sustainable world. I have high hopes and great expectations. Welcome to Stockholm and the 27th consecutive World Water Week. I wish all of us a very fruitful outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Van Gord. I'm now honored to introduce the Swedish Minister of Environment, Minister Carolina Skog. In June, Sweden and Fiji co-hosted the UN Oceans Conference in New York. Taking into consideration this year's World Water Week theme, what actions do you feel are important to safeguard our oceans? Welcome, Minister. Distinguished Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. It is an honor for me to welcome you to Stockholm, to Sweden, and to this opening ceremony of the World Water Week. It is truly inspiring 
to once again see so many competent and experienced people gathered here to discuss the essence of water. The theme of this year's conference, Water and Waste, Reduce and Reuse, is very timely. Sustainable and efficient management of our water and waste our water and wastewater contribute to many parts of society and has a profound effect on all aspects of human life. Economic growth and sustainable development, sustainable city planning, circular thinking in industry and in production, energy saving, good quality of our water, but not least, uh, but last but not least, it is crucial for health and for a sustainable environment. The challenge of economizing our scarce resources also have an important to reach our global targets for sustainable development and to build societies that are prepared for a changing climate. Water is a necessity for life and an engine for development. By raising awareness of the ecosystem services that water serves us with, it comes clear that a sustainable water management is paying off. It is a very good investment. To secure our water and oceans, we need to go upstream and work with the sources with the source to sea approach. We need to go to the source and minimize the impact on our water, minimize waste, uh, the waste that we discard in our scarce and vulnerable waters. Our water and our oceans cannot and must never be seen as dustbins. Partnership across sectors are needed, considering the close relations and synergies between different uh, SDGs. We also need partnership and cooperation between actors to drive both oceans and land issues, to tackle the problems of plastics, for one example. The theme of this year gives us a good platform to discuss the interdependency between the Sustainable Development Goal 6 on water and sanitation, and the one and goal 14 on oceans. The linkages of this was one of the priority areas raised by Sweden at the historic UN Ocean Conference this year, initiated and presided by Fiji and Sweden. I know that several of you here were in New York, and I want to take the opportunity to thank you for contributing to the great success that we think that the conference were. A special thanks to the President of the United Nations General Assembly, Mr. Thompson, who is present here today, on which, uh, and whose leadership was crucial for the success of the conference. Sweden is proud to have the unwaived support from all of you in our joint pursuit of saving the, our oceans. The Oceans Conference was an impressive global manifestation in support of the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans, creating a political momentum. The conference resulted in three main outcomes. Firstly, it adopted a declaration saying it's time to act. Secondly, the conference generated nearly 1,400 voluntary commitments from many kinds of stakeholders. Around 400 of these commitments are addressing land-based pollutions. Thirdly, the conference partnership dialogues provided concrete recommendations on how to save our oceans. The Oceans Conference is over but it's not an end point, it was the takeoff for continued engagement and work. 
Ladies and gentlemen, at the UN conference, the Swedish government made a number of commitments to reduce marine litter and to strengthen the source-to-sea approach. At the global arena, the UN Environment Programme has a unique role, working with both environment and clim climate at policy levels, including the synergies between these. Sweden, Sweden at the conference committed to support in total by 1.5 million euro different global implement implementation programs. We have also, together with several neighboring countries, committed to ban the use of microplastics in Rinnestav cosmetics by 2020. This is a concrete example of how we can reduce pollution by the source, by not producing it. The government have also committed to a sustainable uh, plastic management. In the budget for Next year, the government have proposed to increase the financing to combat marine litter and microplastics. We depend on the oceans, and the oceans need our support and our care. And I'm therefore happy to tell you that Sweden will soon take another step towards the goal of healthy oceans and sustainable water management. And being in a very intimate room with the water family, I hope that you can keep a secret. <laughs> Tomorrow, Isabella Levine, uh, ocean champion and deputy prime minister of Sweden, will announce new investments in the protection and the restoration of the waters around our country. With consistent hard and Hard work and a diversity of measures, we will get closer and closer to the goal. It is comforting to know that all of you share this vision. Because our world's water and oceans are a shared resource and a shared responsibility. The consequences of environmental and climate degradation degradations affects women and children the most. We need progress in all the mentioned areas to improve living conditions for all. We, change, we all face challenges with the increased, increasing need of water. Innovation, cooperation will be essential as we join forces and secure a more prosperous future for our children. We must do this, we must do it together. I hope this week will boost your inspiration to continue your hard work forward. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Skog. I now have the great pleasure uh, and privilege of welcoming the President of the 71st Session of the United Nations General Assembly, His Excellency Peter Thompson. You have taken on the task of initiating a process to ensure stronger coherence and collaboration between the main UN global agendas. How do you think water can enhance the implementation of both the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. Welcome, Your Excellency. Yeah, that, is, that is Fiji up there. Uh, <laughs> I know the island quite well, but uh, I want to assure you that there's a bit more to Fiji than just that. Uh, there's about 365 islands, one for each day of the year, and the island that I'm from is a wee bit bigger than that. Um, yeah, I'm a fifth generation Fijian, I may not look it, but um, my um, great-great-grandfather was the captain of a sailing ship from Scotland who ended up in Fiji, uh, and we've been there ever since. Uh, but he got there about 50 years after the first significant European settler who was a guy called uh, Kalle Svensson, who was, of course, from Sweden. 
He had a uh, pretty amazing career there, actually, and um, had some big effects on Fiji, which last through to today. I won't go into them. You can read about him. Uh, he was called Charlie Savage in Fiji, but his name was Carly Svensson. He ended up being consumed by his enemies. Um, <clears throat> I first came to Stockholm and uh, got a warmer welcome, and uh, that was about three or four years ago when uh, I came to meet the government about uh, setting up the partnership which resulted in the Ocean Conference. And I'll uh, say a little bit about that in due course. <clears throat> But um, I did want to just respond to that question which was put to me. Um, you know, water is absolutely fundamental to the uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Water is a source of life, obviously, you all know that. <clears throat> and the fundament of our uh, existence, which is climate and the ecosystem, is what we in the Pacific Islands find ourselves at the front line of. Um, uh, when you look at an island like that, you can understand what a 2.5 meter sea level rise will mean over the next 100 years. Uh, and for many of our neighbors, such as the Republic of Kiribati and Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, they don't have any islands with, uh, that, that are any higher than that. So they're in deep trouble. Uh, so the fundament, uh, the climate, the world's climate, uh, the world's water resources, the things that we all share, and uh, without uh, us, our proper stewardship of that fundament, uh, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda obviously goes nowhere because uh, without the fundament we can't exist. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here, Excellencies, all courtesies observed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for this World Water Week. It's the first time I've been here for this. Obviously, I've heard about it many times over the years. Your fame has spread. Um, and this city has been at the forefront of sustainable development since uh, the uh, first Earth Summit, which was back in 1972. And that was actually the year that I started out in my career in rural development in Fiji. And I remember reading about it then because I've been in development basically all my life. Uh, and coming from Fiji, the subject of water was always an absorbing one for me, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, I actually... Uh, you know, came from rural Fiji, so we, we, we drank water and we showered from rainwater that we caught in, uh, from the gutters off our roofs and into the tanks. Uh, so one was always very respectful of water and where it came from. And then uh, in the 1970s, when I started working in rural development uh, for the government, um, my, I was a district officer and I had many wide uh, uh, responsibilities, but uh, the thing that got me really passionate was water and sanitation. And why was that? I could see that in the villages the, 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 the health problems that we were experiencing, a lot of it stemmed from bad sanitation and poor water supplies. Uh, women were still collecting water from rivers in uh, large parts of my districts. Uh, and so putting in small uh, village water supplies, you know, finding a, a good creek to uh, put a little dam in and reticulate uh, uh, pipes from became a passion of mine, as did putting in pit latrines. I must have dug thousands of pit latrines in the 70s uh, where we'd just put a cement slab down uh, with a cement riser and UNICEF gave us plastic uh, U-bends to drop into those risers. And with those pipe water supplies, you know, we had water seal uh, toilets in the villages. And it was very rewarding to see the, uh, the, the, the change in life. And so I learned very early in my career that uh, adequate fresh water and sanitation facilities were vital to healthy lives and to education, because schools needed them, and to gender equality, because girls needed them to go to schools, and uh, all other aspects of sustainable development. With all the good work that's been done in the intervening decades, it would have been reasonable to think that everybody is okay now in that uh, regard. But uh, sadly, as you know, that's not the case. There's almost 2.4 billion people around the world who still have no access to improved sanitation. And there's a growing number of regions and countries uh, that are experiencing rising water stress exacerbated by rapid population growth and by urbanization. 60% of the world will be living in urban centers uh, by the year 2050, and of course, by climate change. <clears throat> and that is getting back to that fundament, why Fiji's taken on the challenge of uh, chairing the COP23 in Bonn from November this year. 
Anyway, none of this is news to a room like this. Um, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, um, water and sanitation have got a central place in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which were universally adopted by the United Nations back in September 2015. Together with the Paris Climate Agreement, those 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, represent, without doubt, the best chance that our species has for survival on this planet. And without their implementation, we're in trouble and we continue to steal from the future of our grandchildren. And as a grandfather, that troubles me deeply and is why I made, uh, during the 71st session of the United Nations General Assembly, the implementation of the 17 development goals to be our priority and our theme for the year. And uh, we have been concentrating heavily on that over the last 12 months. In this context, I believe that SDG 6, the water and sanitation goal, is in need of a major push. Some of the goals are doing better than others. Uh, I think SDG 6 needs a push. And the time is right, and I encourage you all to join together to develop a concerted global action to deliver on the targets of SDG 6. So, Ocean Conference, ladies and gentlemen, creating a global movement to deliver on the targets of SDG 14, if I could give that as an example of what you could be doing on SDG 6, was exactly what we sought uh, when we uh, set out to achieve the Ocean Conference, which was held, as you know, in New York last June. So the governments of Sweden and Fiji came together to obtain a UN mandate. That in itself is not an easy thing. Uh, and we got that UN mandate for the conference and then worked in a solid partnership to arrange and co-host the conference. And I really want to underline the, uh, that word solid. Uh, it's amazing, you know, we were at different ends of the earth, uh, southern, northern hemisphere, one a developing country, the other developed country. Uh, and that partnership was just rock solid from, uh, from the moment we shook hands on it until the delivery of the conference. And here in Stockholm, I want to play, uh, pay a particular tribute to uh, Minister Isabella Lovin, who led the charge on the Swedish side and was a superb um, uh, advocate and partner throughout to make the, the conference the great success that it was. From the outset, the Ocean Conference was designed to be a game changer in reversing the cycle of decline into which the ocean had uh, been caught. Uh, without a doubt, uh, the conference has succeeded dramatically in raising global consciousness about uh, the state of the ocean, the uh, deleterious state of the ocean uh, that human activity has caused. Uh, I refer to marine pollution, especially plastic pollution, uh, ocean acidification, ocean warming, big problem for us in the tropics, uh, overfishing, uh, IUU fishing, uh, high seas governance or lack of, and uh, damage to biodiversity and coastal ecosystems and, uh, and marine ecosystems. But um, you know, my wife hits me with a frying pan, uh, figuratively, uh, when I just go on and on about problems. Uh, human problems, she keeps pointing out to me, have got human solutions. And so we were a solutions-focused global event, the Ocean Conference. Uh, and we also characterized the event by inclusivity uh, and common purpose. Anybody that felt left out of that Ocean Conference didn't get it uh, because everybody was uh, invited and uh, was welcome and their solutions were looked for. Thousands of participants uh, attended and including heads of state and government and high level representatives from governments and the United Nations system and intergovernmental organizations, civil society, uh, the scientific community. We based the conference very strongly in science. Uh, the business sector obviously essential to the solutions and other relevant stakeholders. From them all came that urgent call for action on behalf of the ocean, as captured in the three main outcomes from the conference that the minister uh, succinctly uh, gave you earlier. But just to remind you, there was that, that call for action that was a, that was a very carefully uh, negotiated document by the 193 member states of the United Nations over many months, and uh, I do, um, 
recommend that you have a read of that because you'll see it's a very strong call for action, a universal call for action that was subsequently adopted by consensus in the General Assembly. And it is a political a statement of political will um, for us all to go forward on ocean action. So there is uh, no backward glances when you read that statement. Uh, then secondly, there were the, uh, in, the partnership dialogues the minister referred to. This is where we got the best of world expertise to come and, and, and explain what the problems were in the seven um, areas that SDG 14 uh, identified from marine pollution through to, let's say, fish stocks. And uh, as well as presenting the problems, those partnership dialogues also uh, gave us the solutions to the problems. As I say, it was a solutions-oriented exercise, and we captured those solutions. And uh, thirdly was the uh, nearly 1,400 voluntary commitments that were basically crowdsourced from the world, from governments, and from organizations, and uh, those two have been captured. So the ultimate value, of course, lies in, um, uh, in, in uh, what we do in terms of implementation. Uh, to ensure that implementation uh, works the way we want it to, uh, the game-changing effects that we were after. Uh, we need a common work plan, and we need a dedicated set of actors, and we need achievable targets. Now, the work, the work plan is currently being formulated uh, at the United Nations. Uh, the uh, DESA, in particular, the Department of Economic and Social uh, Affairs, uh, is modeling the many outcomes of the conference uh, into uh, workable clusters, and at the same time, the relevant actors are being uh, organized for the task ahead, uh, and um, many of us that were involved in the Ocean Conference will continue our work uh, through with that work plan. And the targets, of course, they already exist in the form of SDG 14, uh, with three of the goals uh, targets, SDG 14's targets, set to mature in 2020. So basically, we've got three years uh, for those. And in the meantime, uh, the other good news is that the governments of Portugal and Kenya uh, have offered to host a second UN conference in 2020, thereby giving us three years for our common work plan to be acted upon. When we gather again in 2020, we'll have the opportunity to comprehensively assess our successes and failures over the three years that we've got before us now in that work plan and make the necessary adjustments that we need to make to uh, get us through to uh, the maturation of SDG 14 in 2030 and achieve the success that we're after for the ocean. So ladies and gentlemen, the great human endeavor of implementing the work necessary to achieve the targets of the ocean goal is underway. We must never forget that when it comes to the environment, everything is connected. It makes no sense for us to consider terrestrial environmental issues, freshwater challenges, or climate change in isolation um, as they're all part of the same planetary ecosystem. Uh, this is obvious to you all. Uh, one affects the other under the immutable laws of nature. Thus, we must always have an inclusive and an integrated approach uh, and uh, never fall back into the failing silos of past status quos. So I'm uh, very glad to hear about the theme of the Water Week this week. I think you're, you're right on uh, the subject. Having said that, we're all called upon to put our individual skills uh, and ideas and energies to where those skills lie. Uh, we all have something to bring to the work uh, ahead. So if, for example, you're a sanitation engineer, it's expected that you'll be working to improve humanity's uh, sanitation conditions. Uh, whereas if you're a coral reef scientist, for example, we expect you'll be advancing knowledge in that field. But of course, none would imagine, and least of all yourselves, of course, that uh, the state of sanitation and coral reefs are anything but directly connected. So I commend the World Water Week for bringing us together to discuss the challenges of our time and to uh, appreciate our interconnectedness. North and south, east and west, the ocean unites us uh, and we have to bring humanity back into a relationship of balance and respect with the water, that great reservoir of H2O, which uh, is of course shared by clouds uh, into the, the, the rivers and lakes which give us the fresh water that we drink. So. Um, 
I really look forward to the discussions that are going to be held this week and for the action that will arise from the week's outcomes. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. And thank you for traveling all this way to be with us here today. Thank you. The next speaker has been a true inspiration to me and to all who have pursued a career in the field of water cooperation. Those who believe that water can be a catalyst for peace and prosperity. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce this year's Stockholm Water Prize laureate, Professor Stephen McCaffrey. In its citation, the Stockholm Water Prize nominating committee recognized Stephen for his path-breaking leadership and legal scholarship in international water law, and this unique contribution in three specific areas. His seminal work on treaty negotiation, his major scholarly works including the book The Law of International Water Courses, that I'm sure many have read in this room, and his leadership providing expert legal advice, wise counsel, training and facilitation of complex negotiations with a wide range of stakeholders. He acted as legal counsel to states in several negotiations concerning international water courses, including, including Argentina and Uruguay, Pakistan and India, and Slovakia and Hungary, all which were heard by international courts and tribunals. Your effective diplomacy during years as UN Special Rapporteur for the International Law Commission led to the 1997 adoption of the draft articles on the UN Convention on the Law of Non-Navigational Use of the International Water Courses. Please join me in welcoming the laureate of the 2017 Stockholm Water Prize, Professor Stephen McCaffrey. Thank you very much, Therese, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure, indeed, and honor uh, to be here. Excellencies, honorable ministers, ambassadors, distinguished mayor of Stockholm, uh, Stockholm Water Prize laureates and award winners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's, again, a great pleasure and privilege to have this opportunity to say a few words about the importance of international water law in a changing world. Let's see if I can get this. Well, I don't really have that much control over anything. There we are. Um, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Well, this was uh, Shakespeare's typically subtle way of <laughs> demonstrating how important lawyers are to societal cohesion. He put this, these words in the mouth of one of his less savory characters, a fellow called Dick the Butcher. <laughs> Mr. Butcher, uh, <laughs> was a supporter of a rebel who thought that if he disturbed law and order, he could become king. So Shakespeare actually meant this memorable sentence as a compliment to lawyers and judges who instill justice in society. While the literal meaning of these words might resonate with some even today, God forbid, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words about why the law is needed 
and will be of even greater importance in the future stewardship of our most precious resource. The world is running out of water. Not literally, of course. We know the amount of water on Earth has been about the same for billions of years. But relative to the human population, that amount is declining at a rapid rate. A UN study this year found that the world population will reach 8 billion in 2023, just six short years from now. Our numbers are forecast to reach 9.8 billion by 2050. As long ago as 1970, almost a half century ago, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution whose preamble contained the following observations, and please bear with me as I quote these at some length. Quote, considering that water, owing to the growth of population and the increasing and multiplying needs and demands of, of mankind, is of growing concern to humanity that the available freshwater resources of the world are limited and that the preservation and protection of those resources are of great importance to all nations, conscious of the importance of legal problems relating to the use of international water courses, inter alia with regard to international water resources development, recalling that the use of international rivers and lakes is still based in part on general principles and rules of customary law, convinced of the necessity to promote the work on the progressive development and codification of the law of international water courses and to concentrate this work within the framework of the United Nations, end of quotation. The resolution goes on to, quote, recommend that the International Law Commission as a first step take up the study of the law of the non-navigational uses of international water courses with a view to its progressive development and codification. That's the end of the quote. Indeed, much of the world's fresh water is shared by two or more countries. Some 60% of the planet's fresh water flows uh, are, occur in the more than 270 international drainage basins of the world in which around 40% of the global population lives. Climate change, as we know, introduces great uncertainty into water policy formulation and into the governance of internationally shared freshwater resources. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has warned, for example, that arid areas of the planet will become even more dry in a warming future. I'll come back to these warnings in a moment. All of this could be viewed as a prescription for conflict. This is hardly a novel idea. In fact, the word rival is derived from the Latin words rivas, meaning stream, and rivalis, meaning a person using the same stream as another. This became the English word rival in the late 16th century, hence the idea that those sharing freshwater resources are more or less by definition rivals. The great American writer Mark Twain is reputed to have coined the phrase, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. And indeed, in the Western United States where I come from, this seems to be practically a way of life. Um, you can see two farmers discussing water rights in this ditch under the supervision of an arbitrator here uh, in, in black, perhaps the only sane one of the group. Um, but I remain optimistic. Actually, those who have studied the dynamics of the relations between countries sharing freshwater resources have concluded that water sharing is more likely to lead to cooperation than to conflict. So the glass is at least half full, and I think it's actually more than half full. 
Courts and tribunals have recognized the necessity of sharing freshwater resources equitably for a long time. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes of the U.S. Supreme Court said in a 1931 case between New Jersey and New York, and I quote, a river is more than an amenity. It is a treasure. It offers a necessity of life that must be rationed among those who have power over it, end of quotation. But to maintain stability among countries sharing fresh water, it's helpful and in some cases necessary that they all play by the same set of rules. I've used the analogy of a game of football, which we call soccer in my country. Um, and you have to wonder uh, what it would look like. I mean, it's bad enough as it is, but what it would look like without referees administering an agreed set of rules. It would likely look rather ugly, something like Thomas Hobbes' State of Nature, where the life of man, as he said, we'd say humans today, was nasty, brutish, and short. Not a very optimistic <laughs> outlook. Uh, but this is why the international community, acting through the UN General Assembly as early as 1970, asked its International Law Commission to codify or write down the rules that had been developed over time through the practice of states sharing freshwater resources. The idea was and remains that if you write down a set of behavioral norms, they become more definite and certain and more likely to generate compliance and indeed general observance than if they are unwritten. And I should pause to explain here that until the end of the Second World War, most international law was unwritten. And there were very few multilateral treaties. Most of, most of them were peace treaties. This unwritten call, uh, law is called customary international law precisely because it's formed by practice or custom engaged in by states out of a sense of legal obligation. It took the International Law Commission, or ILC, 20 years to complete the task the General Assembly had assigned it. That's a long time. It testifies to the complexity and controversial nature of the project. But in the end, the Commission came up with a draft that was generally acceptable. The draft was then used as the basis of the negotiations that produced the UN Watercourses Convention in 1997, as we've heard. As of today, the treaty, the UN Watercourses Convention, has 36 parties. But because of the way it was produced, it's generally taken as reflecting the basic principles of customary international water law applicable to all countries. The most fundamental principle of international water law is that states sharing fresh water resources must utilize those resources in an equitable and reasonable manner vis-a-vis -vis one another. This is the first general principle set forth in the UN Watercourses Convention, and it's been recognized by the International Court of Justice in a number of decisions, the first having been rendered just four months after the UN Convention was concluded, well before it even entered into force. What does this principle mean? Well, it means many things. It means that use must be fair vis-a-vis -vis co riparians in light of all relevant factors and circumstances. It does not mean that co riparian states are entitled to equal shares of water, something that's obvious if you think about it for a minute. But it does mean that all riparians enjoy what we call equality of right, such that a downstream country, for example, has the same right to an equitable share as its upstream co-riparian. Above all, the principle is flexible. It recognizes that what may be an equitable allocation of water uses and benefits today may not be so in 10 years or even five. It is this flexibility that makes equitable and reasonable utilization particularly well-suited 
to our efforts to deal with the impacts of climate change. The implementation of this principle depends on the observance of other supporting principles, among which are the duty to take all appropriate measures to prevent the causing of significant harm to co-riparians, the duty to exchange relevant data and information concerning the water course, and most fundamentally, the duty to cooperate, which is a thread running throughout international law. Our world is changing, and I'm not referring here to the rather convulsive political changes that seem to be occurring practically on a daily basis in my own country. I'm referring to changes brought about both by population growth and chiefly by global climate change. The IPCC has given us rather dire warnings about the impacts that climate change is likely to bring not only increased temperatures, droughts, and floods, but also less snow cover in the mountains, less ice, less permafrost, an inappropriate word as it turns out, permafrost, river flows that come earlier than we are used to because warmer temperatures melt snow and cause much precipitation to fall as rain rather than snow, already arid areas becoming even more dry, sea level rise due in part to temperature rises at the poles at twice the rate as the global average, et cetera, et cetera. We're actually experiencing some of these impacts now, as confirmed by a report submitted by climate scientists in the United States in January of this year. This is a report concerned principally the United States. The report was endorsed by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences as part of the congressionally mandated national climate assessment that is conducted every four years. These changes are bound to exacerbate existing tensions between countries over shared water resources and to create new ones. Again, there's no sign that these changes will stop in the foreseeable future. Conditions will continue to change, bringing with them an increased need for resiliency on the part of human societies in general, and for my purposes presently, countries sharing fresh water in particular. How can countries deal with these changes and resulting tensions? Well, through diplomacy, of course. But diplomacy starting from a blank slate is difficult, to say the least. It's aided considerably by a normative framework that all sides accept. It's my belief that this normative framework is the UN Watercourses Convention. Not every country accepts every detail of the convention, of course, but it represents a starting point as demonstrated in the negotiations between Nile River Basin countries. Beginning 20 years ago in 1997, in which I was privileged to assist, while the Nile Cooperative Framework Agreement these negotiations produced is not yet in force. It's had great influence in dealing with some of the most profound changes ever to occur in the basin, as I will explain in remarks later in the week. Your Majesties, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried in these brief remarks to show how, especially in the area, uh, in the era of the Anthropocene in which we're living, which is already bringing great changes to a climate system around which much of human society is organized, an accepted normative framework is needed to facilitate ad adaptation by countries to these changed conditions. As I've said, I believe the UN Watercourses Convention provides this normative framework. It contains generally acceptable uh, bases on which the diplomacy that will be increasingly essential to deal with changing conditions can be conducted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, uh, Professor McCaffrey, and thank you for putting the theme of this year, Reduce and Reuse, into the framework of climate change and the need to share water in the future. We will now move on into the next 
section of our program this morning with a panel discussion. And it is with great pleasure that I now introduce the Honourable Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia and Chair of Sanitation and Water for All. He will moderate this morning's panel. The Honourable Kevin Rudd joined Sanitation and Water for All after a distinguished political career in Australia, where he was the 26th Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs. His interest in water and sanitation began when he was Minister of Foreign Affairs and commissioned a review to see which areas of Australian aid spending were most beneficial. The results showed that investing in water and sanitation greatly improved the lives of people and was where Australian aid spending yielded the greatest return on investment. As Chair of Sanitation and Water for All, he has been advocating for strong finance, financing strategies to bridge this finding, uh, financial gap, one of the greatest barriers to reaching the Sustainable Development Goal on water. I'm just going to wait a little bit uh, until everything settles down. This morning's panel will discuss how water can offer solutions to the challenges we face in, in relation to global resilient growth. How it can amplify benefits of investments in a circular economy and how we can better manage our resources and waste. I encourage you to be forward-looking, bold, and to inspire each other to identify effective solutions, not only in terms of technology and financing, but also in terms of ideas that can be transformed into effective policies. The Honourable Kevin Rudd, I now hand over to you. They tell me to stand here, so I hope that's okay. Uh, the picture behind you of Australia's national camp capital, which is Canberra. Uh, that's Parliament House. The, um, the, um, it's good to be back here in Sweden. Uh, it's good to be here in Stockholm again. Uh, and it's good to be here at uh, Siwi. Uh, Sweden is a good country which has an extraordinary history of support for international development. There aren't many in the world. I know most of them. Sweden's one of them. So you're a good bunch of people here. Uh, Stockholm, I used to live here years and years ago, uh, back in the 80s. So uh, to all of our Swedes here, there are many Swedes here at the moment. So, I took it on Sverige, I took it on Stockholm, I took it on Mellerin, I took it on Stockholm, Fuergården. And all those things are here in Sverige. And Slussen. The, um, I uh, grew up on a farm in uh, rural Australia, um, not quite as dry as the one behind you, but I do remember uh, growing up on a farm where, in fact, uh, one of the rolling discussions in a small community was the lack of water. And uh, we had the great advantage of having a natural well. So whenever the drought hit, we became very popular because we then would actually truck water from our well to the rest of the community for domestic use. It's one of those informal riparian arrangements uh, which uh, our Stockholm Water Prize winners just referred to. And for those of you who are interested in the wider wash sector, uh, I also grew up in a farmhouse which had no sanitation. Um, that's what we had. Uh, and. Uh, and so, wherever you come from in the world, uh, I have some direct experience of the challenges of water security, water supply, and sanitation for all. Uh, later on as Prime Minister, I took water even more seriously. And those of you who know my country well know it's the driest continent on the planet. It's quite big, 
It's somewhere between Fiji and Sweden. It's that large island to the west of Fiji. <laughs> but it's bloody dry. <clears throat> uh, our major river system is called the Murray-Darling. It extends over thousands of kilometers. My task as Prime Minister, in fact responsibility given the priority I attach to water and water security uh, and water pricing, uh, was how do we bring about an integrated basin management scheme for this vast system which covers an area several times the size of Sweden. Uh, difficult politics, Minister, uh, fixing that between six cantankerous states, two territories and a bunch of honorary uh, ministers and state governors, or as we call them, premiers. But we finally got there. Years of jawboning, but ensuring we had water allocations for agricultural use, water allocations for urban use, water allocations to sustain the health of the river system itself, environmental flow. Now, this stuff is not easy. One of the themes of our conference also is about uh, the recycling of water. Uh, and to our friend uh, who's been to uh, inner space, not outer space, uh, I too have uh, drunk the substance. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's uh, part and parcel of being in public politics that when you do a major recycling project, as we did for all our major cities in Australia in uh, my time in office, uh, that the Prime Minister of the day then samples the product to make sure that it's capable of human consumption. <laughs> Always confident that half of the people watching in the Australian public hope that it's not. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the hazards of democracy. But uh, we set a target of 30% of national water recycling. Uh, we're now up to 17. Uh, for a dry country, for us, it's necessary. So why I'm pleased to be here uh, at uh, World Water Week is uh, water has actually been a continuum in what I have experienced and done throughout my life, including now as the uh, chairman of the Global Partnership on Sanitation and Water for All. Um, we do some good work. Uh, what we primarily are focused on is the advocacy for sustainable development goal number six. Peter Thompson spoke of this before. I worry about it becoming the poor cousin of the sustainable development goals. And that is the necessity for all of us across the international community to put every element of effort behind turning it into a success. If we don't succeed with sustainable development goal number six, the other sustainable development goals will fail as well. The other thing we seek to do with um, SWA uh, is that uh, we seek to convene. But in doing so, we take a holistic approach, which is how do we bring together people from the technical community, the policy community, and politics? And not just water ministers, and not just ministers responsible for sanitation, but finance ministers, the guys and girls who control the cash and then prime ministers, who get to arbitrate over all the above. Presidents as well, of course. And the other thing we seek to do is to advocate and to facilitate across the international community convenings of the same. In fact, at the World Bank meetings in uh, Washington in April, we brought together the finance ministers in our target countries where the delivery of basic drinking water and water for sanitation um, is most lacking. Sector ministers, finance ministers, technical community together, and that's the way we make a difference. So today, in this room full of people who uh, know the sector well, um, it's a bit like preaching to the choir, but I suppose if I've got one interest in the panel we're about to convene now, uh, it's this. And that is that we turn this uh, family of the converted into global, uh, global change makers. And within this room, there's the expertise, the talent, the ability, and the political will to do it, uh, because it's there to be done. And I think the way in which it is done, if I could leave this as a challenge for those who come and speak to us now on this panel, is how do we organize what is known to be a given set of technical solutions to most of the problems we face, a given set of legal solutions to most of the problems we face, 
then harnessing the policy energy to make this possible, and then to deliver it through politics. And as I've said to sector ministers across the world and in many forums, I feel your pain. As I've said to finance ministers, I doubly feel your pain, uh, because all of you are competing against finite public resources to make a difference. But if we can bring together these three pillars of what makes public policy work and apply it to this great challenge of water and the great challenge of water and sanitation for all, then we turn SDG 6 into a great success. So it's good to be with you. Now our panel. These are serious folks who know what they're talking about. I begin, of course, with um, the uh, minister that we have uh, just heard from. If I could ask her to come to the stage, Karolina Skog, if I've got my Swedish pronunciation correct. Um, and uh, the Swedish Minister for the Environment, uh, and as she's indicated before, a key activist in terms of the UN Oceans Conference, which took place in June of 17. Uh, if uh, I could also ask to come to the stage, Melanie Schulz van Hagen, Minister for Infrastructure and the Environment from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Then I have uh, Dr. Zaini Ujang, Secretary General, Ministry of Energy, Green Technology and Water for Malaysia. <laughs> it's like the Academy Awards, isn't it? Uh, then uh, Cheng Guangzhe uh, from um, uh, the uh, World Bank, uh, Senior Director, Water Global Practice, and a seriously good person. We call him Captain Water in the World Bank. Um, then representing those with the money, or those who claim they don't have enough, Carlos de la Torre, Minister for the Economy and Finance of Ecuador. Good to have you with us, Minister. And representing uh, youth across the world, no small burden, uh, Ahmed Abderrahman, uh, founder of the Global Village. Now, Carolina, we're in your hometown, Stockholm. Yes. Well, let's start with you. Um, you're um, Minister of the Environment in a progressive country like Sweden. You've got a lot of international experience. Um, you also come from the mun municipal level, if I've got my briefing note correctly. You're in Malmö, okay. Uh, do you speak some Skånsk as well? Yes, I am from, Sk I'm Scanian. Yeah. Okay, good, southern part of Sweden. The, um, tell me what it was like actually managing the politics of water in a municipal government in Sweden, and then the principles you took from that to national government and to your international experience. I'd be very interested in that. Uh, let me first point out that the success, the historic success of uh, water management in Sweden is closely to, related to a decentralized governance. Uh, we have very strong municipalities with their own right to uh, take out tax uh, and also right to finance, for example, investments in sewage uh, by uh, fees. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the base of all investments uh, made uh, on water treatment and sewage treatment. Uh, the other uh, key factor to success is the regional investment banks that have been uh, putting in the money. For example, we have a Nordic investment bank that played a huge uh, role uh, in these investments. It's very seldom pointed out, but it's, I think it's good to know that. Uh, and then, working with that, uh, on the municipality level, you have two advantages. In Sweden, for example, you can take out money and you, to make investment, but you can also have a small scale enough to be innovative. Uh, to set out pilot projects and to develop your work. Uh, and then the role, what I'm taking with me to government, is important to spread the knowledge and the know-how that is developed uh, in the local level. Because that's where I see what we're 
if, if not failing, but not delivering well enough today. There's a lot of interesting innovation work done on the local level in Sweden and across the world. But the know-how and the experiences of this is not you know, pulled in and shared uh, in uh, a way that I find satisfying. We must use this knowledge and spread it uh, so it became more and to scale it up and mainstream it in a better way. In terms of municipal experience, what about water efficiency and how you actually, you talked about innovation at the municipal level. We were able to achieve this sort of progress in Malmö in your period there. How big is water efficiency as a national goal here in Sweden? Um, and if you were to put water efficiency in terms of minimising leakage of pipes and things like that against recycling, where does this fit in your s set of priorities? Uh, recycling of water have actually been more or less a non-issue in Sweden because we've lived in a feeling of abundance of water. Uh, but as Torgny pointed out, we do see scarcity of water in some parts of our country now. Uh, and rapidly a discussion on reuse uh, is emerging. Uh, and we are, need to be humble. Uh, a lot of the debate is that this situation uh, that is new to us is normal in so many parts of the countries. So we need humbly to go out to other parts of the world and learn the basics of reuse of water. Because we don't know it, we don't have the regulations for it, and for example, we don't have a goal, national goal of re re reuse of water. So we need to do basic uh, governance on the national level on that terms and basic learning on the know-how uh, to do it uh, and to take this out to our public. This is new to us, but we need to do it to secure our future. Now, Melanie, Kingdom of the Netherlands, we associate the Netherlands with um, not having inadequate water, but having too much water. <clears throat> the whole experience of uh, dikes and polders uh, and your entire national history. But in an international presentation by the Netherlands in, for some time now, you've spoken a lot about water banks. Give us a sense of um, the evolution of this idea, this concept, and how you would um, support and explain the idea of financing of water and water-related initiatives uh, around the international community. Mm -hmm. and the question is, is how to do... Yeah, on the uh, question of water banks yeah. and uh, water banking, and that is how you actually see the financing of water domestically mm -hmm. and how it applies yeah. internationally. Well, <clears throat> we've got a different system than you see in most countries because we have known for many, many years water boards in the Netherlands, uh, a kind of regional water authorities with their own tax system. When we started many centuries ago in protecting ourselves from floodings, we created these water boards in, uh, to create small polders, uh, make dike rings. We had until last century 2,600 of these water boards with their own tax system. And um, we scaled up in the, in, in the past century and now we've got 26 of them. And we don't, do not have to compete with other political issues because mm. they only uh, select their tax for water issues. And then we've got the national system. So it's not that much on the local and regional level as in Sweden, for example. Um, and on national system, we've got a, a system, uh, it's called uh, our Delta Fund, and we have funding for water issues. And there's no end to the Delta Fund. Most political regimes have a four-year or a five-year plan, mm. and then it stops because the horizon of pol politicians, uh, as you know, is not longer than four or five years. But we have this Delta Fund, and uh, we are able to invest one billion a year in uh, water-related issues uh, yearly, and go on, go on, go on. So we tried, to, we have plans until 2050 to protect ourselves. Uh, from the uh, climate change uh, issues uh, and water-related issues. So, but for other countries, it's very difficult. That's why we try to find uh, uh, solutions, uh, like working together with World Banks or ADB or other banking systems, mm. for um, creating new systems to invest in water in other countries where you do not have such a fund or where you do not have these regional water boards. Mm. But in the end, um, I think, uh, this is the moment where we all should see that climate change is so 
uh, has such a big effect on our resilience that everybody has to find some public funding and not just uh, uh, private funding, but some public funding to protect itself for the future. See, finance is a continuing theme in this conversation, domestic and international. And uh, for me, in Sanitation Water for All, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's the baseline factor. Uh, we can have a thousand conferences like this around the world. Uh, we can reach technical consensus. We can reach policy consensus, even international political consensus. But the core bit at the end of the day is where does the cash come from and to what extent is it generated from uh, fee-for-service, to what extent is it generated from development banks at a subsidised rate, to what extent is it generated by private investors. The experience in Malaysia, my friend, I mean, Malaysia is part of my world. Um, you don't suffer a lack of water uh, in, uh, in your part of the world. But in terms of how you manage water infrastructure, I'd really appreciate your insights. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, today, we are here to discuss about a few challenges that we have in Malaysia as well. Um, there are three parts of funding that we have on infrastructure development for water in Malaysia. One is um, what we call water asset related. And this started in 2007. Um, where all water assets should be under um, a national water asset company. So there is fund from, from ma the market. They have about 45 billion uh, ringgit Malaysia, equ equivalent to one, 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 uh, 10 billion USD. So with what they do, uh, water operators are not supposed to own the assets. It should be an uh, asset-like model whereby the asset company, water company that invests in it. And since it is backed by government, guaranteed by government, so they will be able to get very good uh, financial costs. Say for example, they get uh, AAA uh, rated uh, for uh, credit rate, uh, rating. So it means that whenever they go to banks, they get very decent financial costs. Um, that's number one, so um, mostly uh, companies will go there, and the way they want to pay is through tariff. So tariff must be adjusted accordingly. Uh, number, number two is what we call uh, government development uh, expenditure. Uh, it, is, it is a kind of um, um, subsidy given, but from time to time, uh, this year, say for example, the amount of subsidy we receive is about one billion, uh, compared to, say for example, uh, three, four billion five years ago a year. Uh, it means that emphasis given to the first uh, to make it more um, um, market-driven. At the same time, people are responsible, uh, say, for example, through tariff structure. The third point, which is for a rural area like Australia that you have just now. Yep, sorry. It's gone. So, so these people, they, they normally, um, it's not like Australia. In Malaysia, when you talk about people... Uh, Aborigines in jungle, they don't need money. They, 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 they live without money. Yeah, they, not many people, there's about 3% of the population. But these 3% require a lot of investment by government from time to time. And they are living in a community of 300, 400 people, and they migrate from time to time because of several reasons. So for, that, this, uh, for this community, we have to, to find out uh, ways and means. This is still a challenge, big challenge for Malaysia. Good. Now, Guangzhou, I'm going to come back to you in a minute <clears throat> because you represent the world. He's from the World Bank. <laughs> but I'm interested in the guy with the money here, uh, Carlos, who's the finance minister from Ecuador. In managing the public policy and political debate in Ecuador on the allocation of resources, what is your engagement like with your water minister, your sanitation minister, in terms of deciding where this fits in your national priorities? And secondly, in your country, does it have, as an issue, the status which you believe it needs to have in order to get the financial support that it needs? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there's a very good relation with the minister 
of water in Ecuador. We have a ministry there that's in charge of managing water. Water is a, a primary and vital resource in Ecuador, even in that uh, sense that we have the illusion that we have a lot of water, but how it is distributed is another issue, very important issue. And we have to use a lot of resources to have water in the correct place with uh, people. Uh, having in some uh, parts of Ecuador a lot of water, even we have to control floods, we have to, uh, and in other places we have droughts and sometimes so we have to manage with that. There's one important issue in what has to do with the relation with health expenses and how uh, we can reduce health expenses if we can have more drinking water and sanitation in the country. So that's a very important issue in how you have to manage uh, finances because we are not the ministers of cash. We are the ministers that have to manage with the scarcity. So in that sense, uh, well-defined uh, policies uh, directed to improve uh, more access of people to uh, drinking water and sanitation uh, can help us reducing health expenses in one side. But we have another uh, interesting thing in Ecuador. Ecuador is the first country in the world to have a constitution that uh, it has defined rights not only for people, but for nature. So water is inside these uh, rights for nature that are under our constitution. So we have to work to preserve water, to preserve natural resources, but at the same time, we have to warrant uh, rights for people and the access for people to water. So Carlos, on uh, water pricing or tariffs in your country, how sensitive and how difficult is the issue and how have you managed it domestically? Okay, that's a very big problem because as we have to warrant the rights for people to access to uh, natural resources and in this case to water and the other hand, we have to manage the scarcity of water in some times and by uh, economic logic, uh, scarcity has to be aligned with prices. So if you want to uh, give the correct signals for allocation of resources, it might be uh, the need to have prices in one side. But if you have prices for water, not, I'm not referring to prices for the services of transportation of water, but the prices of uh, water, yeah? If you have in one side prices for water, you are uh, against the rights of uh, people to get water. In that case, you are establishing restrictions for access. So we have to manage balancing both situations. How to manage with scarcity of water in one case without prices, that could be a restriction for people to get to water. So it's a management problem, a very big management problem in which we are right now. Now, Mr. Chen uh, from the bank. <clears throat> Uh, you and I have had many discussions in recent years about um, the real challenge of financing for development in general and financing for water in particular. Um, fine words minus money equals fine words and no result. So as you look from the bank's perspective and the multiple uh, water investments that uh, you're engaged in around the world, where do you see the state of the international debate on water pricing? or water valuation, as some say in more sensitive circles, um, and where do you see it going? I mean, the overall thesis is finance is limited, public finance uh, from the international development banks is limited, domestic finance from governments, always under challenge, unless you have a source of revenue coming from consumers or users themselves. So where does the debate stand now internationally? I think the debate today is much more advanced compared with the last couple of decades. I think, one, I think the 2030 uh, SDG goal really helps to focus on what's needed to achieve that goal. And based on the most recent estimate, altogether we're talking about over $100 billion investment a year that is required to meet the sort of improved access to water supply and sanitation. Recently, at the moment, you know, sort of all public available resources for this particular investment, we're talking about no more than $20 billion a year. The World Bank is the biggest financier for water supply and sanitation, but we're lending roughly about 4 to $5 billion a year. Combined with all the multilaterals, we're still quite far away from that particular uh, investment need. 
which is why there are several things that one need to do. One is to mobilize more finance, which is why I think that at the World Bank Group, one of the most recent initiatives we have is called Maximize Financing for Development. Basically, we want to say how we can help uh, our client countries to tap into a large amount of commercially available uh, financing that is out there in the market. But at the moment, they're earning very low return because they're very really reluctant. They don't want to take risks in investing in water supply and sanitation where there might be risk in losing their, uh, their investments. We're talking about sovereign funds, we're talking about pension funds, we're talking about in institutional funds, we're talking about trillions of dollars sitting in the market earning minimum rate of return. But they're not coming into the water supply and sanitation sector, partly because the sector is not performing. We're talking about mostly among developing country uh, uh, utilities, they're not performing to the level that can attract their financing. So then the next thing is that how we can help these utilities, particularly in urban settings, right, that they can improve their performance, improve their financial governance, accountability, and of course, pricing a structure that is able for them to recover most of the costs. At the moment, not many utilities are able to recover their costs, partly because the tariff was set too low. Now, this related to the point you make is how do we value water? I think uh, as the Honorable Minister talked about, you know, constitution in some countries declared it's a basic human right uh, for obviously drinking water. Nothing, no, not, nothing to doubt about that basic need. Uh, but I think there's different way of managing it. Uh, I think there's ample uh, empirical evidence to show that when you have heavily subsidized water or free water in some of our client countries, it's the poor that will suffer most because they are not the one that are getting the subsidized waters. It's the rich that tend to get the subsidized water because the subsidized scheme is typically regressive because you consume more, which meaning typically high income people, you get more of the subsidies. So we're not against subsidy per se, but I think you can separate pricing from subsidy by you know, using modern technology to much more target the subsidy uh, to help the poor, calculating what is basic need for human consumption or basic, I think the WHO estimate is roughly about 50 liters per day required for basic drinking and sanitation. So you can develop a scheme, sort of a life, lifeline scheme to provide the basic for the poor through cash transfer for targeted subsidy, at the same time making sure that utility have the basic pricing that's required for them to recover the cost, uh, at least the operating maintenance cost and progressively to, to get more in terms of capital costs. Because when they reach that level, then they will become more attractive for commercial financing. That's where coming back to my first point, how they can mobilize commercial finance, because there's simply not enough money there to meet all the needs. Let me just um, develop that line of argument a bit more. Because if we're looking at the sustainable development goals overall, we know that the cost out to, for Agenda 2030 is in the trillions of dollars. We know what the limitations of global public finance are through national governments and through the development banks. So therefore, we look at underutilized funds in all of our pension funds around the world um, and other private funds. Just pushing you one step further on that, which is what practical measures can the bank lead or can the international community support which crosses that threshold about the bankability of projects in water and sanitation? Because for me, this is the, ga the game changer of how you get the cash in quantum to make the difference while still providing a return on the investor. A couple of things. I think let's look at the urban utility, which is obviously the most obvious candidate for mobilizing these kind of resources because you have a capture consumer market, you know, you have a network existing. Now we have done research and look at a range of utilities. There are utilities that are at the bottom that we cover almost no cost to utility that covers almost all costs. And those are the ones that are already in the commercial market. For example, it's uh, Sabesby or for Sao Paulo. They're already listed in New York Stock Exchange, so they can mobilize that kind of commercial financing. So our job, I think all of us, I mean all the partners here, is to work with those countries, with those utilities that are bottom of their performance and helping them using different mechanisms 
be technical assistance, capacity buildings, and using our guarantee instrument to help them move the ladder, mm. become credit worthy. And when they get to a certain level, when they recover the basic operating maintenance costs, typically they will be able to access certain amount of commercial financing. We're not talking about the top level. I mean, I think we might have colleague uh, uh, Robert may be here from Kenya. I think in Kenya, they're already able to tap into uh, banking, uh, uh, access to banking loan for this utility through a credit, sort of shadow, shadow credit rating, so that they make them credit worthy. I think that's the threshold that we want to cross. Because that's the other bit to this, which you might comment on again, or others as well, which is making water investments and sanitation water investments uh, accessible and attractive for domestic finance within countries. We often think of the pension funds, we've talked about that, they're huge, trillions of dollars worth of uh, un underutilized capital, but the bulk of the realizable funds lies within private savings within countries. And so people are not dumb. All of us, we put our money in the bank and then lose it um, because it has zero interest. Um, we buy shares, we may lose it, but people who are looking for longer term, shall I say, uh, investments which will deliver you a response more than buying government bonds, how do you see that unfolding? You mentioned Kenya. I'm really interested as to the examples here. Um, there's several things that one can uh, uh, support this kind of utility. One, like, like I said, is really to develop the basic sort of a corporate governance structure, make this so an accounting system transparent, have a tariff structure that can help them to recover much of the cost. If there's a government subsidy, there has to be a policy that the government provide the tax transfer to provide the subsidy so that it would not become a burden for the utilities. Um, but then you can also use other instruments if you moving to through the ladder, becoming, shall we say, semi-credit worthy, then you can use guarantee instruments that we have to help bring in that. I think your point is, is very valid to emphasize on domestic commercial financing because the revenue typically for this utility or domestic currencies, if you tap into international currency market, you also have the foreign exchange risk as well. So I think it's along those lines, but I think also fundamentally it's about improvement of your services because by improving your services, you tend to get acceptance by increasing tariff gradually. And I think that was the case in the, uh, uh, the example I cite in Kenya. And uh, no pressure on you, Ahmed, but um, Mr. Chen represents the world. Uh, you represent the world's youth. Um, Definitely no pressure. No pressure <laughs> at all. And so when you look at water, and one of the things we're often focused on in this sector are the appalling pictures of uh, young women spending most of their lives carrying water um, and the, the destruction that results in, in terms of um, their livelihoods, their life opportunities, their ability to participate in education. We've seen so much of this, but that's one slice of the reality. Tell me what you see from the perspective of Global Village. I mean, in, listen, it's never easy to represent, uh, first of all, young people of the world, uh, let alone young people in Sweden. Um, but, but I hope that uh, my various experiences, uh, I was born and raised in, in Mogadishu, Somalia. I've uh, uh, been living in Somalia 12 years of my life um, and have really experienced uh, in, in close uh, way, you know, the, the, the um, problems of not having clean water or not having water enough at all. And also seeing that effect that it has on um, a whole population, a whole generation and particularly women as well. Um, and now I live, I'm a Swedish citizen now, so now I live here in Stockholm. And, and, yeah. <laughs> so now I live here, which is, you know, as you've seen behind us, a uh, beautiful country with lots of water, but still uh, we're seeing challenges coming up. And I lived in New York as well, which is a small city, but has the same population as all of Sweden. Um, so I, I may not, you know, represent all of the youth, but at least I hope that I can give some perspective of these three various experiences. From my perspective, um, and, and what we're trying to do in, in our association is to uh, activate young people, especially in, in our town and in, in, in our country. Because, you know, when you are in, in a poor country or developing country, you may not have the means, neither political rights or social rights or social opportunities to really affect uh, some, of the most some of the most difficulties that you are facing. Yeah. But 
in countries like in Sweden, in countries where, where we now today live, where uh, young people, um, even though they are less in numbers than in developing countries, we have the political rights, we have the social uh, rights, uh, we have every opportunity to really affect our world, and we're gonna inherit these challenges. Um, so what we're trying to do is really to, to make sure that we don't only like on Facebook, <laughs> Uh, we don't only, um, you know, hear uh, the cries and, and, and see and witness what's happening, you know, in, in, on the news, but we engage in the political side. We pressure uh, decision makers and we become a uh, force that has to be uh, accounted for or, or to be relied on because we're going we're gonna to inherit it either way. So what you're saying is that intergenerational justice is not just a concept in... Um political theory. Um, it's a reality for those of you who have to deal with the wreckage which this generation leaves behind. Um, Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, again, it it's really is, this is about the future of, of us, ourselves as young people, and, but also the next generation. So, and we, we are seeing the danger that is uh, heading our way. Um, but the challenge is that now in, in some of the developed countries, we have three, four generations living on top of each other. Uh, while in developing countries, you have all the generations dying faster, of course, giving you know, either war or hunger or other diseases, um, even though the whole population uh, of you know, age uh, living standards is still going up, but not, not equally, of course. But we are seeing that in, in close range but there is not, so far there is not enough space in, in, in the developed countries mm. um, because the positions that we are supposed to inherit, <laughs> that we are supposed to, to, to go into are not vacant yet. You guys are living, living too long, as, as I was saying. <laughs> so, well, so we have to demand. I don't know about you guys, demand. but I hope, I hope he's right. <laughs> um, so we have to demand uh, our, our political and our, our, our social uh, rights, not, not in the old ways that you know, we, we, we associate as rights with, but in terms of really affecting the challenges that are ahead of us on the global and national side. So that, that's what we're trying to do. Well, therefore, on behalf of the International League of Ancient Politicians, let me um, <laughs> go back to our two ministers at the end there. Do you, can I ask this of you, um, both Carolina and Melanie, do you sometimes think that the global water agenda has become too big. That is, I've listened to today's conversations. Um, the oceans agenda is huge. I'm so glad that it is now on the UN agenda. And thank you, Sweden, for what you've done with Fiji. Uh, it's a new thing. I remember co-drafting a report in 2012, UN high-level panel on sustainable development, uh, where recommending that the blue economy be part of the, uh, the 2012 outcome document in Rio was a highly controversial thing. And five years later, we've now made so much progress. There's oceans. There's, let's call it big water, uh, which is national river systems, as we've been reminded before, many of them shared by multiple jurisdictions across multiple countries across the world. And then the sectors which uh, many of the, uh, the rest of us are focused on as well, uh, which is uh, water and sanitation, hygiene, uh, menstrual health, the whole spectrum, uh, because they're all interrelated. On the bigness of the agenda, and both its domestic and international dimensions, give me your thoughts, and um, are we handling it effectively as an international community? Carolina, and then Melanie, or the other way around. And by the way, to the panelists, just intervene whenever you like. Shall I start? Well, um, it is really, really big. But on the other hand, everything is interrelated. As, as it was said before by one of the speakers, uh, the planetary system, you cannot uh, discuss the water issues um, uh, using the borders we know. Everything is interrelated. But on the other hand, you have to focus. So, for example, uh, we are a low-laying country. Uh, one third of our country is below sea level, four or five meters be below sea level. Uh, Two-thirds of our country is threatened by floods. Uh, most of our GDP is earned in this low-laying part. So we really have to focus on protecting from flooding. So we created a group with uh, low-laying Delta countries, the Delta Coalition, 
to exchange knowledge. This is what we have to focus on. And on the other hand, as Carolina was already saying, we are also now um, uh, slowly experiencing dry periods. So this is new for the Netherlands. We always had too much water, and now we get some dry summer. So we need the knowledge from countries that have uh, experience with that. And, um, and sometimes you see all the problems uh, occurring in, within one area. For example, Jakarta, the Pluit, uh, the area where uh, the, the city is subsiding due to illegal groundwater uh, uh, subsection. And uh, first of all, you have to uh, give everybody fresh uh, clean water supply. Uh, this is one issue. And then on the other hand, you have to protect the area by bu building a wall or sea wall or something like that. But before you can give everyone a fresh water supply, clean water supply, you need to clean the rivers that are polluted. So you see every uh, part of the problem, uh, not having enough uh, clean water, not having uh, uh, a good system to protect yourself against flooding. Uh, everything comes together within this city. Hmm. So um, we still have to treat water issues as an interrelated uh, issue. Carolina? When preparing the New York conference in June, we thought a lot about that. Uh, all the topics that we were uh, to introduce, everything is so big, huge. How do you start a good, inclusive conversation uh, around fishing, no? uh, shipping, uh, sanitation, everything, all these really, really big uh, issues that are hard to grasp when you when you look at the global pictures. And we worried uh, that the conference uh, would be overtaken by big words or big problems with uh, very little substance. But mm. when there, the setting of a lot of parallel sessions and an inclusive pro pro process where everybody could engage from their starting point, uh, we saw that the discussions were really concrete. Uh, they were based on solutions, practical solutions, on local level, regional level, national level. Uh, and then, summing that up, we can grasp these really, really huge problems uh, through a number of concrete examples. Uh, and we need to stay focused on the solutions, so spreading the words of solutions, making these problems manageable for people. Uh, and not just pushing in too much uh, of this is a global big problem to a single citizen, because it becomes very difficult. Uh, and one issue that are helping us here is the issue of plastics, because um, it's understandable. You see the pictures of a whale in Norway filled with plastic bags, or you see pictures of uh, plastics in, uh, in the oceans, and of course, you know, it's bad. It's no good uh, for the environment, for the health. Uh, and that issue, both it's uh, something that goes into the heart of people, but it's also a good starting point with conversations where you can start with microplastic and end up in fishing, or start with plastic bags and end up in sanitation. You can, from that, very concrete start conversations and which end up in different kinds of problems. And I think for us as a community, we should use this momentum that I see in a lot of interest and worrying about the plastic issue because it is concrete mm. and it's a good starting point for uh, conversations that are reading out of our little family here uh, and out to the citizens. Can I add? Yes. Um, mm. Malaysia is a small country, more or less similar to uh, the size of Sweden, but we have 30 million population. Uh, but in terms of water management, we have 14 states having their own right on their own tariff and their own water companies. So despite we are talking, your question was how to manage global water partnership and whatnot. So for a small country, we have 14 ways of understanding issues. Out of 14, three companies making money. Yeah, they are on stock market, they are really good gung-ho on the investment on water infrastructure and water uh, businesses. But other states are not making money. They, are, they, 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 they receive a lot of uh, loans and, 
and subsidies from state government. It's not federal government, but state government. So my point is this. What we need to know, uh, probably, uh, in, in global partnership, is to understand the principles that we can learn together. Say, for example, uh, I was 30 years in academics, teaching water and water industry. And then, recently, I went to, to this business, this, this, this job. I think the most critical deciding success factor is financing. How you finance the projects, how you get back the money, how you ensure investments, uh, managers are attracted to invest in your, your business. And at my, within my portfolio, I'm also managing energy. So energy is big in Malaysia. If you want to have 1,000 megawatt investment, thousands of banks waiting for, to, to give money to you. Yeah. But if you want that amount of money for, for water industry, we, we will probably find one or two interesting. So your case study for what Chen talked about before. I'm Melody? Sorry, but it's very interesting to see how you can combine energy and water because the water treatment plants in the Netherlands were really energy consuming factories. Hmm. But nowadays, the organic uh, material in wastewater, we use it to create biogas and then use it for electricity. So the factory is running on its own waste mm. and they can even deliver to the, to the grid. And the same is there is also a material in it uh, from which you can make fertilizers for the agricultural sector. So instead of being costly, they are now um, delivering energy and delivering fertilizers. Yeah, therefore, in Malaysia, Ministry of Energy and Water is, is in the same, in the same uh, uh, ministry. So, indirectly, we are say, what we are saying, we are migrating from isolation of policy on uh, water resources uh, to combine it with energy, more sustainable. Uh, Carlos, and then to Guangzhou. Okay, and what has to do with the problem of pricing water? Okay, we have to uh, make differences. One thing is water in cities where you have drinking water, you have sanitation, you have infrastructure there, so you can price the service of a distribution of water. You can price the service of uh, having in one side raw water and then the processing into drinking water. Okay, there's no problem. You can decide how to price it you can charge, it's a political decision, if you charge the costs of infrastructure, financing infrastructure to people or to the state by a subsidy. But what happens in Ecuador and uh, Latin American countries in what has uh, to do with the use of water for agricultural pro purposes? We have a lot of natural flows of water and we have to uh, manage those flows because people can take water for their crops from rivers, from lakes, and how you can manage that without an infrastructure. In the cases we have infrastructure for, a, a, for distribution of raw water, it's okay, it's the same problem as in the cities, but how do you manage in the case of the rivers in which somebody in a crop upstream takes more water than what it's needed, so it has externalities, makes externalities to the downstream users of water. So in that case, you cannot put the price to water, but you have to uh, design uh, measures to manage uh, this water so everyone can have access to water. So are different problems and what has to do with pricing. But we think that the water itself cannot have a price. I'm fascinated by the earlier comment, um, Chen, I'm sure you're going to go onto this about energy and water together, but over to you. Right. I think you asked the question how you would bring all these big topic into something perhaps we could be, I mean, from a development perspective, we actually see water is fundamental development issue particularly on the, for many of the low-income developing countries. In fact, in the next few days, we'll launch a number of reports. One of them is actually uh, looking at the dynamic between water supply and sanitation and hygiene with poverty and with health. We partner with uh, CEDA in that. And that's what we call the uh, uh, worst poverty diagnostics. It shows the interaction. So fundamentally, unless we address the basic access to water supply and sanitation, we're going to continue to have this vicious cycle about poverty and about shape, how do we promote shared prosperities. Another element of that is actually, I think some of the early speakers talking about, is that the inclusion agenda, and linking about women and water. 
and that was another report that we will be launching in looking at the dynamic of that mm. because the fact that, uh, again, looking at the poor countries, when you have basic lack of access to water supply and sanitation, it tends to be the women that suffer most in that process. And unless you're inclusive, you will always be getting into this vicious cycle. And the third piece was on looking at water and securities and looking at the vicious cycle between water scarcity and conflict. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the global, you actually see areas that have the so-called most conflict currently are also the area that's most water stress. And that will be even worse as we move forward in the next 20, 30 Hence years. Hence why work on both the Nile and the Mekong, for example, have been so critical. Ahmed, you wanted to contribute? Yes, I, I just would like to add also not to forget that um, in terms of the youth, that there is also a global diaspora that are youth, uh, that are really the connection between what's going on in, in countries that where these challenges are even more, uh, more, more uh, bigger and more challenging than, than in, probably in, in, in countries where the financial and technology is possible. So I would love you to encourage that um, don't forget the, the global diaspora, especially the young people who are the connectors between these different worlds. Because I've, I've seen my friends and I've seen my own mother always calling pretty much every day uh, back home to make sure that, um, you know, that she can help by sending remittance, which is, if you look at financially, the, the amount of that is much bigger than anything that, that you know, uh, other banks or other international organization can, can do um, uh, or, or deliver to our uh, former countries. So that's something that's also very important to, to think of. How do we include them um, both in terms of uh, education and, and in, 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 in your community of, of, of um, in professional water um, people, but also in terms of politics and, and, and financially? How do, we, how do we use this global diaspora in the young generation, let them be the connectors. That, that I think is very important, not to forget. Good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've heard from this panel. You've heard from Ahmed saying that any of you over 30 are going to be around for far too long. Um, <laughs> make room for his generation soon. The, uh, you've also heard this question of, uh, is the agenda too big? And if I look across this vast uh, room today at World Water Week, you have people who are dealing with the whole spectrum of the challenge we face. And uh, the problem, as, um, as we were reminded just before, is every part is related to the other. But there's an analogy here, I think, with climate change to some extent. <clears throat> and that is the climate until recently, relatively recently, had no spokesperson. There was no one acting on its behalf, no one acting on the planet's behalf because the planet at the end is silent and doesn't have a human voice, let alone a single human voice. Yet after 20 or 30 years of this business around climate, suddenly um, there is a very large global constituency which collectively gives it voice. And then that's translated through to a political resolve to then introduce questions of policy and pricing about how we make a difference. I wonder, therefore, in the global water debate, whether we are, therefore, at the first decade or so of that evolution. Um, I hope so, because 70% of the planet is blue. No one at present speaks for the oceans. No one at present speaks for water. But that's what it was like for the climate not too long ago. And so I think through these combined efforts, we suddenly start to have a voice from the human community. And then policy and action follows, as with climate, we hope. Which brings us, I think, to the third set of conclusions from this panel. And I take uh, my Malaysian colleague's uh, observation as being the most acute. Someone who spent his entire career on water, for him, lesson number one, two, and three is finance. The technical solutions are basically there across the entire spectrum of what we're dealing with. It's how we mobilize finance to turn the global consensus through a single voice on behalf of the world's oceans and waterways into a reality. Please thank the panel. And now I understand, because I'm now the temporary compare of this show, 
uh, we're going to hear from um, Torgen Holbegang on behalf of um, uh, Seaweed. Uh, thanks a lot, panel, for an impressive discussion and um, ideas that was put forward. And thanks a lot, Honorable Kevin Rudd, for an outstanding moderation and also sharing with us your experience from both Australia and uh, your work on a global scale. Uh, now, this panel has set the tune for our week to come. Uh, excellent week ahead of us. You contributed with a lot of ideas uh, for deliberations. Now, this discussion will be ongoing. And now, you, all of us here, have the opportunity also to contribute to our discussion. We have a question that will soon be posted on our screen. Yes, here it is. Now, I will ask every one of you, and you can find it on our app. Apart from goal number six among the sustainable development goals, which SDG will benefit most from an increased focus on water and waste, reduce and reuse? You can find it on our app, you can re respond to it, and we will give you back the outcome of this discussion at the concluding session on Friday morning. Now, I would also like to thank Therese for leading us through this morning. Uh, fantastic uh, morning. We had got a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of also insightful uh, knowledge that we have been given. Finally, thanks a lot for, to all of you for coming here, joining us this morning. I wish you a fruitful and inspirational week ahead of you. And once again, welcome to Stockholm. Enjoy. <laughs>